Level zero. You're standing on a beach, waves lapping at your feet. The water's crystal clear, maybe waist deep. You can see every grain of sand, every shell, every tiny fish darting between your legs. Sunlight penetrates everything here, turning the ocean into liquid glass. This is the epipelagic zone, the sunlight zone, and it extends down about 200 meters. This is where 90% of all marine life exists, where photosynthesis happens, where the ocean feels safe, familiar, almost boring. The water temperature is comfortable, maybe 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see the bottom. You know exactly how deep it goes. Coral reefs bloom in riots of color. Sea turtles glide past. Dolphins leap through the surface in choreographed arcs. This is the ocean from postcards, from screensavers, from every beach vacation you've ever taken. This is the ocean that makes you think you understand the ocean. You don't. Because right now, you're standing on the roof of a building. And beneath you, there are 36,000 feet of water, darkness, and things that would make your brain refuse to process what your eyes are seeing. The ocean doesn't start here. It ends here. Everything you think you know about the sea, all those nature documentaries and finding Nemo references, that's just the lobby, the gift shop, the place where the ocean is still pretending to play by the rules. But once you drop past 200 meters, the ocean stops pretending entirely. Level 1. The light is dying. Not gradually, but aggressively, like someone slowly turning down a dimmer switch that controls the sun itself. You're now in the mesopelagic zone, and the first thing you notice is the color blue. Not the cheerful turquoise of tropical waters, but a deep, oppressive blue that seems to absorb sound, absorb warmth, absorb hope. The temperature has dropped to 40, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. You can't see the surface anymore. You can't see the bottom. You're suspended in liquid twilight. Only 1% of sunlight reaches here, and that's just barely enough for your eyes to register shapes, shadows, movement. Photosynthesis is impossible. Plants can't survive. The food chain runs on marine snow, dead organisms and debris falling from above. It's literally raining death. Bioluminescence becomes the dominant language. The bristlemouth fish flickers with photophores to camouflage against faint light. The barrelay fish has a transparent head, its brain visible, so its eyes can rotate upward to spot prey. Every night, billions of organisms rise from these depths to feed in surface waters, then descend before dawn. An entire ecosystem commuting thousands of feet vertically every 24 hours. The pressure here is 20 times greater than at the surface. Your lungs would collapse. Your body would compress. But this is still the shallow end of deep. Because below this, the twilight doesn't just fade. It dies completely. Level 2. Welcome to the bathypelagic zone. Welcome to permanent midnight. There is no light here. None. Not a photon. Not a glimmer. The only illumination comes from the creatures themselves, bioluminescent organisms that have turned their bodies into living light bulbs in the most hostile darkness imaginable. The temperature has plummeted to just above freezing, hovering between 35, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure is now 100 times greater than at the surface, which means every square inch of your body would be crushed under 1,500 pounds of force. The water here is different. It's denser, thicker, moving in slow currents that take centuries to complete a single circulation. There are rivers within the ocean here, underwater currents flowing through the abyss like highways through a deserted city. And in this eternal night, evolution has gone absolutely insane. The anglerfish carries a bioluminescent lure dangling from her forehead. Her mouth is lined with needle-sharp teeth. The male bites into her flesh and fuses permanently, his body atrophying until he's nothing but gonads. The viperfish has teeth so long they can't fit inside its mouth. It must unhinge its skull to swallow prey. The gulper eel's jaw unhinges to create a cavern bigger than its entire body. It's mostly mouth. Food is so scarce that nothing can be picky. Their metabolisms run in slow motion, their bodies gelatinous and fragile. And yet, life persists. Against all logic, life has found a way to thrive in conditions that resemble alien planets more than Earth. But we're not even halfway down yet. And the deeper you go, the more the ocean stops being a place and starts being a concept. Level 3. You are now in the abyss opelagic zone, and the word abyss doesn't even begin to capture the existential emptiness of this place. The pressure is 400 times atmospheric pressure. That's 6,000 pounds per square inch. Your bones would crack. Your organs would liquefy. Your cells would burst. Even a submarine would need walls several inches thick to prevent implosion. The temperature is a steady 35 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing, and it never changes. No seasons, no variation just cold, dark, and crushing weight forever. The ocean floor is closer now, maybe a thousand meters below, but you still can't see it. The darkness is so complete that it has texture, like you're swimming through a liquid void. 
The creatures here are even stranger than above because they've abandoned any pretense of looking like fish. They're gelatinous, transparent. Some have no eyes at all because eyes are useless when there's nothing to see. The sea pig crawls across the abyssal plains on tube feet, filtering sediment. It looks exactly like a pig made of translucent jelly. The giant isopod is two feet long, a pill bug the size of a football, scavenging on whale corpses. It can survive for years without eating. Then there's abyssal gigantism. The giant squid, the colossal squid, the Japanese spider crab with a leg span of 12 feet. The ocean floor is covered in ooze, the skeletons of microscopic organisms raining down for millions of years. There are no currents, no waves, no tides, just stillness. The kind of stillness that makes you understand why ancient sailors feared the ocean. Because it's not the storms that kill you, it's waiting. The emptiness, the realization that you are cosmically, profoundly alone. But even this isn't the bottom. Even here, there's still deeper to go. And what waits there will rewrite your understanding of what life can be. Level 4. The Hadal Zone. Named after Hades. The Underworld. The Land of the Dead. This is the deepest part of the ocean. The trenches. Massive scars in the Earth's crust where tectonic plates collide and one is forced beneath the other. The Mariana Trench. The Tonga Trench. The Philippine Trench. These are not gentle slopes. These are vertical cliffs dropping into darkness deeper than Mount Everest is tall. The pressure here exceeds 1,000 times atmospheric pressure. That's 16,000 pounds per square inch at the deepest points. To put this in perspective, if you took the Eiffel Tower and balanced it on your thumbnail, that's the kind of pressure we're talking about. The water itself is compressed to the point where it behaves differently, becoming denser, more viscous, less like water and more like liquid mercury. Nothing should live here. But in 1960, the Bathyscaphe Trieste saw a fish at 35,797 feet down. That changed everything. The Mariana snailfish holds the record for the deepest living fish at 26,830 feet. It's translucent, gelatinous, barely ossified. Deep-sea amphipods grow to 13 inches long and swarm over organic matter, devouring it in hours. Xenophyophores are single-celled organisms that grow to 4 inches across. They shouldn't exist. The trenches host chemosynthetic ecosystems, life powered by chemicals seeping from the Earth's crust, not sunlight. But there's one more level, one more place where the ocean becomes something else entirely. And it's not just deep, it's alive. Level 5. Imagine you're on the ocean floor, maybe 7,000 feet down, maybe 9,000. The pressure is crushing. The darkness is absolute. The temperature is just above freezing. And then, in the distance, you see light. Not bioluminescence. Not a flashlight. But a glow like someone lit a fire underwater. You move closer and the temperature starts to rise. 40 degrees. 50 degrees. 70 degrees. 100 degrees. The water is getting warmer, which makes no sense because you're at the bottom of the ocean where everything should be frozen. And then you see it. A hydrothermal vent. A crack in the Earth's crust spewing superheated water at temperatures exceeding 700 degrees Fahrenheit directly into the freezing ocean. The water is black, thick with dissolved minerals, iron, sulfur, and metals, erupting in plumes that look like underwater chimneys made of stone. These are called black smokers and they're portals to hell. Giant tube worms grow up to 8 feet long with no mouth, no digestive system. Bacteria in their bodies convert hydrogen sulfide into energy. Eyeless shrimp swarm vents with heat-sensing organs, Farming bacteria on their bodies. Yeti crabs wave their claws through vent water, cultivating bacterial colonies and eating them. The vent water is acidic, pH as low as 2.8. Yet this is one of the most productive ecosystems in the deep ocean. These ecosystems might be how life on Earth began. Hydrothermal vents provide energy, chemical building blocks, and protection. Some scientists believe the first living cells emerged here billions of years ago. But hydrothermal vents exist only where the Earth cracks open. Rare, isolated, temporary. And that raises a darker question. What happens to life when you go even deeper, past the vents, past the chemistry, to the absolute physical limit of survival itself? Level 6. We've reached the boundary, the absolute physical limit of where vertebrate life can exist. The Hadal snailfish lives at depths exceeding 8,000 meters. And scientists believe it represents the deepest possible limit for fish. Not because we haven't looked deeper, but because physics says fish can't exist deeper. The protein TMAO, which fish use to stabilize their cells against pressure, stops working beyond a certain depth. The molecules themselves begin to fail. It's like hitting a biological wall written into the laws of chemistry. Below 8,400 meters, no fish have ever been found. Not because they're hiding, but because they can't be there. The pressure is too great. The proteins denature. The cells collapse. Life, at least vertebrate life, has reached its absolute limit. 
But invertebrates exist all the way down to Challenger Deep, 36,037 feet below the surface. Pale, ghostly creatures moving under pressures that would turn a human into paste. We've explored less than 5% of the ocean floor. Every submersible dive discovers new species, dozens, sometimes hundreds. In 2023, researchers filmed something in the Tonga Trench they couldn't identify. It was large, fast, and disappeared before they got a clear image. The bloop, recorded in 1997, was one of the loudest underwater sounds ever detected. It matched the signature of a living creature larger than a blue whale. The sound has never been heard again. The deep ocean isn't just unexplored, it's actively resisting exploration. The pressure destroys equipment. The darkness makes observation nearly impossible. The vastness makes comprehensive surveys unfeasible. Life has reached its chemical breaking point here. Proteins fail, cells collapse, vertebrates disappear entirely. And yet the ocean keeps going, deeper still, to a place so extreme that only a handful of humans have ever reached it, and most never return to the same. Level 7. This is it. The deepest point in the ocean, the lowest elevation on Earth's surface. If you took Mount Everest and dropped it into Challenger Deep, the peak would still be over a mile underwater. Only four people have ever been here. Jacques Picard and Don Walsh in 1960, James Cameron in 2012, and Victor Vescovo in 2019. That's it. Four humans out of the 117 billion who have ever lived have touched the bottom of the world. The pressure here is 1,086 bars. That's 15,750 pounds per square inch. The water temperature is 34.4 degrees Fahrenheit. There is no light, no current, no variation, just endless oppressive stillness and weight. James Cameron described it as lunar, desolate. What struck him most was the silence, absolute suffocating silence. Victor Vescovo found plastic, a plastic bag and candy wrappers on the seafloor of the deepest point on Earth. But he also found life, new amphipods, sea cucumbers, jellyfish, microbial life we'd never seen before. The Mariana Trench sits at a subduction zone, creating earthquakes and volcanic activity. The trench is getting deeper every year. When you descend into Challenger Deep, you hear things, creaks, groans. Some are the Earth itself, moving, shifting. It's like the planet is breathing. At the deepest point on Earth, the ocean feels less like a place and more like a presence. Silent, heavy, watching. But even here at the very bottom of the world, the ocean still has one more trick. Places where water behaves in ways that shouldn't be possible at all. Level 8. Imagine you're in a submarine cruising along the ocean floor at 10,000 feet, and you see a lake, not above you, below you, a lake at the bottom of the ocean with a distinct shoreline, waves, and a surface. You descend toward it, and as you get closer, you realize this isn't water. It's brine, salt water so dense that it doesn't mix with the surrounding seawater. It pools in depressions on the seafloor, creating lakes with their own ecosystems, their own chemistry, their own rule. These brine pools are five to eight times saltier than normal seawater, with densities so high that submarines can float on them. The boundary between brine and seawater is so distinct, you can see it on camera, a shimmering interface like the surface of a lake. Except it's underwater. It's a lake in the ocean. It shouldn't exist, but it does. And it's lethal. Anything that swims into a brine pool dies. The salinity instantly pickles flesh. Around the edges, you'll find a graveyard of corpses, but, but on the shoreline, there's life. Mussels filter the water. Tube worms cluster around the margins. The jacuzzi of despair in the Gulf of Mexico is filled with methane and hydrogen sulfide. Yet the rim is covered in life. Brine pools might be windows into what the ocean was like billions of years ago. They're time capsules preserving conditions from a world we've never seen. Lakes beneath the ocean. Water that kills on contact. Chemistry that rewrites the rules of survival. But the ocean doesn't stop at depth alone. In some places, it hides beneath ice, sealed away for millions of years waiting in complete isolation. Level 9. The deep ocean doesn't just exist in the open sea, it exists beneath ice. Antarctica, the Arctic, Greenland. Beneath the ice shelves, there are cavities, voids, spaces where seawater is trapped between the ocean and kilometers of ice. These are subglacial oceans, isolated from the surface world for thousands, sometimes millions of years. Lake Vostok in Antarctica is buried beneath 13,000 feet of ice, sealed off for 15 million years. Scientists found water at 30 degrees Fahrenheit and life. Bacteria. Organisms isolated from Earth's biosphere for longer than humans have existed. These lakes are pitch black. The pressure is immense, and yet life persists. Beneath floating ice shelves, there's an entire ocean stretching for hundreds of miles. Scientists have found fish and microbial mats living in near total darkness. And then there's Europa, Jupiter's moon, covered in ice. 
Beneath that ice, scientists believe there's an ocean kept liquid by tidal heating from Jupiter's gravity. If there's life in Europa's ocean, it would be the ultimate deep-sea ecosystem, alien. Entire oceans trapped beneath ice. Life evolves without sunlight, without seasons, without contact with the surface world. And if that can exist on Earth, then what else might exist in the depths we can never truly reach? Level 10. Here's the final level. The one that doesn't have a number. The one that exists not in meters, but in mystery. No matter how advanced our technology gets, no matter how many submersibles we build, how many cameras we deploy, how many years we spend exploring, we will never see most of the deep ocean. Not in our lifetimes, not in our children's lifetimes, possibly not ever. The ocean is too vast, too deep, too hostile. We've explored 5% of the seafloor. We've mapped maybe 20% at low resolution using sonar, but seeing? Actually putting eyes on the terrain, the creatures, the ecosystems? We've barely scratched the surface. There are species down there we'll never discover because they live in places we can't reach, because they're too fragile to bring to the surface, because they exist in ecosystems so remote and so isolated that we'll never stumble upon them. There are geological features, underwater mountains, valleys, caves, that have never been seen. There are currents that flow for thousands of miles in complete darkness, carrying nutrients, organisms, and chemical signals and patterns we can't predict. And then there's the truly unsettling possibility that there are large creatures down there we haven't found yet. Not because they're hiding, but because the ocean is so incomprehensibly massive that even a population of large animals could exist undetected. The megamouth shark wasn't discovered until 1976, and it's 18 feet long. The colossal squid wasn't filmed alive until 2002. The giant oarfish, which grows to 36 feet, is rarely seen despite existing in oceans worldwide. These aren't cryptids, they're real animals, and we only found them recently. So what else is down there? What else exists in the Hadal zones, the trenches, the abyssal plains, in regions so remote that no human or robot has ever visited? We've explored less than 5% of the ocean. Most of it lies beyond our reach, beyond our machines, beyond our ability to observe without destroying what we're trying to understand. There are depths where pressure erases technology, darkness erases vision, and distance erases certainty. And somewhere in that remaining 95%, in trenches, plains, caves, and currents we've never mapped, life is still moving, still adapting, still evolving in ways we haven't imagined yet. The ocean doesn't reveal everything. It never has. And it never will.